In Hunter the Reckoning, you will find out that something is amiss supernaturally for you or your friends. People have gone missing, people have died. You investigate the facts, find out what it's doing, how, and hopefully that will lead you to a weakness that you can exploit to finally face the monster. Along the way, it might be revealed things aren't black and white, but those are tricky decisions that you will have to balance as you decide how this thing will face its reckoning. And that is the general premise of the new Hunter the Reckoning 5th edition, which comes on the heels of Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition, which were both originally released in the 90s, so they have a very long history. But today in the review for this new edition, I'm going to be talking about the new rules, the new vibe, the monsters, the uh, human antagonist organizations. This game sets those things out so beautifully and usefully for you to use in your games. And I, as a GM, I really appreciate that. So let's go into how it does that. The new mechanics it uses to customize this experience for a kind of personal mortal frailty kind of horror vibe are the desperation dice and danger mechanics. And also there's some things attached to your character, but we'll get onto character creation stuff later. Desperation is a counter for the whole table, as is danger. But one of them's good, mostly, and the other is bad. <laughs> Which, you know, pretty much tracks with the whole world of darkness. Nothing comes without a price. Desperation is a tracker from one to five that rates how desperate your team is. It is also that number of dice being available to any of your players to use to boost their dice pools, to do better, to pull on their inner strength, uh, something about them that there's kind of empowered them to go on this hunt for noble reasons, mostly, to, uh, you know, give them a boost in desperate situations. And that tracker increases and decreases as you play. And I mean, it's, it's kind of in the name, the desperation of a situation will increase and escalate as you progress through a campaign or even through a, a single session, depending on if you lose the monster, if someone gets hurt, if one of your players gets hurt, if you mess up in some significant way, that is an opportunity for the GM to increase that tracker and not only kind of rate exactly the the dire situation you're in, but also to give your players a dice pool that they can use in moments of desperation. This is actually exactly what I was hoping for when I was setting out what I wanted to see in this game. I mentioned the stress system from the Alien game, which is very similar, except instead of for individual characters, this dice pool is for the whole table. But it's a very effective way of kind of binding the table together, which I found has been a bit of a problem sometimes in Vampire the Masquerade with, in previous World of Darkness games, there have been uh, people working at cross purposes for, you know, fun political reasons. But in this game, if you're fighting a monster and it wildly outclasses you, pulling on that five dice in a truly desperate situation makes your player really want to go for that and everyone else is rooting for them and you know even though the things that have led to that building up have been problems it gives them uh more reasons to go on and more reasons to uh, attempt something truly outrageous. But as always, because this is a horror game, you can't escalate things just by giving the players good stuff. When you roll a one on a desperation dice, that could mean a couple of things. If it's just one, one, then you add to the danger tracker, which we'll cover in a bit. But if you roll two or more ones, then your character loses the drive, loses the ability to use the desperation pool. And that leads into kind of a nice little tiny story arc that they've built into the system called Redemption, where depending on what your player really uh, wants while they're out on a hunt, 
they have to do and be helped by the team to do different things which then allow them access to the desperation dice again so if the drive on their character sheet is curiosity and they're out there to learn about maybe all the different ways to kill monsters or how they can use monster bits to help people the curiosity in them dies for a little moment and to redeem themselves and rekindle that flame they as a cell as a group must uncover new information about their quarry anyone in the cell can achieve this which i think is a really nice kind of once again binding the group together moment and it, like it can be anything it's just a tiny story built into the character that um i really appreciate so i think this works really well the uh, desperation obviously also goes down if things are going in your character's way the way they want they've learned stuff they've uh killed the monster they've saved someone desperation goes down and uh i think that's a nice kind of counterbalance to the horrible uh, uh supernatural advantages that the npc monsters have against them they have this and it's also incorporated into the narrative hunters specifically unlike you know fbi agents that might be paid to hunt down vampires so that the government can learn stuff about them or uh you know some guy going on a rampage because he's getting revenge on a monster that killed someone uh there's something about hunters and the book doesn't go super in depth into this but it's kind of like a spark that you can decide exactly what it is whether it's just an event whether it's the psychology whether it is being inspired by the divine like in previous editions um and that's something for either the entire group or the individual player to decide that spark in them but only hunters on uh on the kind of reckoning path have this desperation that they can draw on in moments of peril which i think is really cool it's um nice and thematic but it's also a really cool meaty mechanic thing that all the players are like watching this pool of dice in the center of the table grow and shrink and they'll have feelings about that which is my favorite part of the game the other important part of the game that is linked to that is the danger tracker again this is a number from one to five or more the game says it's not very specific about that but it is essentially something for the gm mostly to use as a difficulty calibration sort of and it's not actually super specific about what it is for it is <laughs> can be used as a cudgel i imagine if you're at danger five obviously a lot of things have gone wrong up to that point narratively it tracks whether the enemy knows about the hunters whether the enemy is willing to do something about them or if they've you know messed up somehow and become uh, exposed to supernatural things stuff's gone wrong again similar to desperation but it's more of a kind of always goes up number but it's also a number that the players can see and for instance if the gm wants to decide how much damage the monster does to them when they're like in a physical fight they can use the danger number they do one aggravated damage or if they're in a real tight spot after a long campaign they will do five or more damage to the player and you know escalating this kind of story arc they might die from that it's mentioned in a lot of different places in the book so for instance if you're trying to decide how many guards there are at a particular place there's a part in the rule book that's like use danger number of guards so it's very flexible um some of the problems uh come in this book where i am often left asking questions which is sometimes a good thing sometimes uh, a bit kind of woolly where i wish it had more specificity and this is one of them 
Danger doesn't have anything super specific that it does, but it is there to escalate things. It is used as a, a barometer for how difficult various dice rolls should be. Or perhaps at a certain number of danger, the a, a certain narrative event happens, like one of your contacts gets kidnapped or dies or something. Um, it's, yeah, it's really good. Once again, for that story arc that you're building towards as you cli uh, climax the story and go to face the monster. Uh, but also, it's very woolly. So, the I mean, I would do what the book suggests, which is kind of write down for your players. Um, not in super specific terms, but like what will happen at each danger number or maybe... Uh, an idea of what the danger number will affect, like difficulty of dice rolls and amount of damage that you take against a monster. I don't know. It's it's designed as a kind of use this for whatever you want, but then like the the remit is so broad that uh, uh, it's it's sometimes difficult to decide. I have choice paralysis um, and. In, a, in the midst of a campaign, I'm sure it would kind of become obvious what it's supposed to be for, for your group. But um, deciding that is, you know, a minor inconvenience. And one thing I've mentioned but haven't explained that's core to this experience is drives. There are a lot of things on your character sheet, but the most important, well, one of the most important things is drive. It is a single word prompt that gives your character the that spark that I mentioned. Whether it's curiosity, revenge, envy, or uh, an oath that they've sworn, your character will use this to push forward their um, desires to fight a monster or hunt. And I think this is a good place for a player to kind of calibrate exactly what kind of story they like, whether it is I am a good paladin for justice and I am going out to unequivocally fight evil in a world of shades of grey, or perhaps you have at some point mistakenly or knowingly aided an evil monster. Uh, do, how do you feel about that and whether it is something you need to atone for? Uh, there's there's a lot of options here, and honestly, um, this is kind of the good side of the non-specificity of the book. Specificity of the book. Um, this is they've got a list of ones that are really useful, but you could write any any of your own. You could write your own, and it would fit and it would work in the book because they have plenty of examples of how to integrate it into the campaign. It's called Drive for a reason and it worked in the old editions and it still works here so it's really nicely integrated into this new desperation system. But now we're on to my favourite part of the book, the monsters. I'm using monster here as kind of a generic term for ghosts, vampires, werewolves, fey creatures, a, 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 a boglins, I, I don't know, it, it could literally be anything because this book, the monsters are written so beautifully, I would honestly buy a 300 page monster manual with just reams of monsters written in this style. It has their backstory, it has the rumours that are circulating around the town about what they're up to and the people they've affected. Um, it also has their motivations, why they go out and do what they do. Um, and what it does most importantly is provide a sense of the unknown. If you use, you can just make an entire campaign about one of these monsters and it would be a ton of fun. <laughs> I, I cannot overstate how genuinely impressed and excited I am to use these monsters in my campaigns. And I think that's because in the world of darkness, usually the monsters are very neatly broken down into their categories, as they should be, 
when you're playing a vampire, you want to know what powers they have, what clan they're from, you know, their history, how old they are, all of, like, their blood strength, all of these different uh, various parts to them you can use and en enhance your experience with. But having that in a hunter campaign where it is scarier not to know everything and to have room for mistakes, have room for unexpected powers and abilities or coming up against something you thought was one thing and turns out to be another is exciting. And they do categorize the the monsters in in this book when they write them into like werewolves, vampires, other creatures outside of that and ghosts and things. What is more important is that these monsters are not this is what a werewolf does. It turns into a giant thing with claws and howls. No. They are specific characters. I actually don't want to explain too much about the monsters, so people are spoiler free, but I guess if you're GMing, follow on, or if you're a player, skip a bit. Uh, I'll put a marker in the video. Right, so monsters. There is a werewolf called Footpad who is a loner, but will help underdog hunters if they're fighting a vampire or something, and it looks like they're gonna lose. Turns up, kills it in one hit, makes a quippy one-liner, disappears, because some monsters are still assholes. Uh, <laughs> um, but of, by the same token, if hunters are fighting a werewolf, he will not tolerate that and will go to town on them. So uh, it's kind of this loner werewolf character that you may or may not want to try and take on because he's so useful to you, but at the same time you've got to tiptoe around all of his, you know, personal convictions about being a Shan First Nations person. He feels that uh, he needs to fight monsters as well and has, you know, a conviction to fight the people that have done wrong to him and his people. It's uh, a really fascinating story to integrate and might not be the main antagonist of your campaign, but there are plenty of others that you can do that with. Um, and it presents questions for your players to answer, like, is this a good guy? Uh, do we want to help? Do we want to avoid? It is a dynamic situation that your players can use and have fun with. I have two favourites, one of which I will showcase in a kind of actual play where I, I explain the rules as I go, uh, so that's uh, a character that you'll have to find out later, or by the book I guess. But there's another one that I think is great, and really all of these lean into uh, amazing classic horror tropes, but there is a ghost in here who is the lost little girl of Baguio. She is a ghost who was murdered and is seeking revenge on her murderers. Classic trope, right? But there's some twists. If your players investigate it, they will find that she is kind of victimizing some taxi drivers. They uh, end up crashing um, because she is taking taxi rides and then disappears. Like, they're losing out some money, they feel worse after being in her presence, um, and but it, it, it changes whether they will want to destroy her or help her when they find out about how she was killed. Um, not to, you know, spoil too much about it, but um, it's, it's interesting because, like, she is fully aware that she is a ghost. She doesn't know anything about any other supernatural stuff, but she has learned about her powers and is going to use them to take revenge on some truly awful people. So, again, questions for your players. Do they help her? Do they destroy her? Uh, living versus death questions, where, the value of life, all of that good stuff. And eh, I really can't wait to put this in a campaign and see what my players do. That's enough for uh, enumerating monsters. It goes into many of them and they are not clearly defined in what they are because it so to reinforce this unknown quality about about them so that you can mix and match stuff it doesn't have to be 
a classic vampire. It doesn't have to be a classic werewolf. They can have a variety of things and legends about them, but it really puts a focus on an individual monster that your players can learn about to the nth degree if they really want to. For those looking to create your own monsters, the uh, structure of every single monster is the same, so I guess you could use that as inspiration. And it has some very generic, like, charm or transform uh, abilities that you can apply to your own monsters as you're making them. But the tools there are not super limited, even though it does have some pretty good advice about what monsters are and are intended to be in this book. Um, and just talking about the the last monster i was because we're out of spoiler territory uh this game has a really nice um international uh, writing team as well that have put focus on stories and characters from the philippines and also from south america because as far as i understand it there are huge communities of world of darkness fans in those places so it's nice to hear the different ways that those writers put emphasis on the things going on in their countries and you know the various international folk tales that kind of build build this beautiful tapestry of stories of you know what's a vampire from the philippines how do they work versus a vampire from america or europe or south america they are all different in their own way um and it, yeah it gives gives you lots of space to explore new places and new types of character but also serves those audiences quite nicely i think and what would a small group of hunters be without their huge organized and well-resourced capacity of a hunter organization they exist to provide a counterpoint to provide other possible motivations for wanting to hunt monsters whether it is a government fbi agent looking to find a foothold in the global conspiracy of vampires or perhaps a, a religious zealot from the society of leopold looking to destroy what they see as truly evil or perhaps even the arcanum a, a knowledge hoarding group of elitist uh, academics who couldn't care less about whether people die as long as they understand why and maybe they get a cool new magic book out of it who knows what i do know is that they're cool they're not as cool as the monsters in my opinion but they do provide a nice counterpoint there's i think honestly surprisingly my favorite organizations from this book are the corporate organizations they have the orpheus group who are a, a bunch of corporate agents who have learned to use technology to project themselves into the ghost realm and provide remote surveillance or you perhaps talk to the dead and learn things that they shouldn't or couldn't otherwise they are clearly messing with something they have no idea the full extent of but they're still willing to try and make money from it and ah, oh, it's a wonderful story and they're so fascinating to me i think there's also like a, a siri orpheus game that you can talk to uh a, a, like a ghost story or something it's cool anyway um orpheus group is awesome i also quite like the manila department of justice which has a special rehabilitation program where they take people from jails and send them out to fight monsters as kind of a reduce your sentence deal it's uh horrifying and encountering that in uh in a campaign once again raises plenty of moral quandaries for your players um yeah i think the organizations are not my favorite part of this book because they might not always be useful it's quite a, a large bureaucratic side uh, with, which, well, you can still encounter a single individual, but it adds a very large dimension to the game, which, depending on the scale of what you're looking for sessions number-wise, or, you know, just preference-wise, might not come into play. I think they'll be useful, um, 
in some situations but given what i see as the longevity of like a player character's progression in this game it's not very big compared to others um because there's not a huge number of powers and uh, you don't want them to become too powerful otherwise it takes the challenge out of it but i think that's just my personal preference for cool supernatural stuff i was also hoping for the organizations to be a way for the world of darkness to expand its narrative and its lore a greater deal than it does i understand that obviously if you have a section in the book called law your players might read that and they'll know what's coming but if you're going to find a place to you know introduce various uh various concepts that people looking for stuff outside of hunter might be interested in i i don't think there's a great deal there for those people uh, even though it it might be a bit niche but that's certainly what i was hoping for and uh the the organizations are just kind of described as what they do who they are and uh it doesn't you know it doesn't provide any surprises for world of darkness veterans and now on to characters this is obviously the bit of the book you'll probably spend the most time in your characters are empowered with edges which are uh advantages that only a hunter can possess uh supposedly um things like having global access to an internet network having a range of vehicles or guns or tools be able to create things in the midst of battle um and then on to other su more supernatural stuff like a relic or maybe even the ability to repel supernatural creatures a lot of this stuff like i said with danger is left vague so that you have a solid rule system like if you want to procure a van at short notice and you have the appropriate vehicles edge you can do it there's a role for that there's a system there's limitations so you're not like i want like a 50 tanks you can't do that um uh but there's um there's a structure there and then onto that you can write your own reasons and narrative about exactly why you have access to an entire depot of various cars or what it is that you hold close to your heart that protects you from the powers of sorcerers or you, you know where that ancient artifact you wield comes from where, why you have a katana why you have two katanas I, d I don't know it's um it's not an extensive kind of powers list it's not like you can shoot lasers from your eyes you can meld into the ground it's it's mostly not supernatural it is mundane stuff that um you can use in a specific scenario there's a cool one which is drone pilot you are so good at using drones like other people can use drones but your the the drone that you have is specially made for one type of moving around it's flying it's got wheels it's got something that you really want it to have and it will do that better than anything else so um it's it's not like the older editions where the edges were you have the ability to melt the mind of a monster you can make them feel remorse um that has entirely been removed if you want to add that I, the creators are kind of saying uh if you want to put that as the reason or the kind of mechanical net or narrative effect that your power has it's there it's just not as potent um which will obviously disappoint some people but for me i want to play hunter because it is about fighting something vastly more strong and ancient and powerful than myself something that you wouldn't be able to overcome otherwise through ingenuity through luck grit those are the things that push you through and not having mystical divine powers um it is an entirely different vibe there was a lot of judeo-christian themes running through the old one which is you know divinely inspired you have these magic powers that you know if you get hurt you get stronger that kind of thing 
less so here. Um, and on the character side, it's not as exciting as having magical powers or like um, some vast benefits. But there are, are cool little additions that they've made, like you're the group cook and you can make people feel better with a meal. Um, and just like really nice things to have or like you've got an aura about you that makes uh, people that can see it suspicious of you. Um, that sort of thing that really drives into telling a cool story. Um, and I, I like that vibe way more. Um, it feels more personable. It feels more relatable. Um, and it, it's easier to see a, a hunter character fighting against the odds. And, you know, it really kind of cements the the stories that this game is for. Um, as opposed to, like, some grand adventure D&D thing or, you know, fighting and killing God. It's, um... It, it all wraps that nicely together. Although I will say the characters do have quite a lot of stuff on them that is not necessarily superfluous. You might need it still, but it feels like a bit of a carryover. It, um, so for instance, this game still contains touchstones and convictions, which are a character NPC which your character relates to and that's a beautiful story edition but uh, having it on your character sheet mm, doesn't have any effect uh, aside from this is a person I like them or I hate them and this is the conviction the kind of moral rule I use to uh, keep myself uh, on the straight and narrow as I as I go on this hunt. In the same vein, they also have chronicle tenets, which are rules in the same way that um, more specifically allow you to tailor the vibe of your campaign. So if it's got some really great examples. So if you want a neo-noir vibe, it suggests vices thrive in the fractures left by the stresses of the hunt. The hunter's calling is thankless. No good deed goes unpunished. Or if you want a lighter vibe it's like never kill the innocent stand against injustice honor and earnest desire for redemption um i think those things are useful to write down but having it on a character sheet in that way i don't feel necessarily represents what they're suggesting it for which is a kind of semi safety feature which i i think should definitely be written down like we don't want to cover topics such as genocide because that will upset me um that that kind of safety feature and the the way that the rules here the chronicle tenants here are incorporated doesn't quite jive for me don't get me wrong i don't think they're bad or useless but for a single character sheet combined Touchstone, conviction, chronicle tenants, a desire and an ambition all on there is a lot of prompts to land on your player at one point. Now you won't use them all at the same time and having stuff to reference is useful but it's not necessarily, I, I feel, going to provide a well-rounded character person kind of creation experience it just provides more stopping points where a player often in my experience has to reiterate the things that they are building their character in different ways so if your character your, your players are into that kind of challenge uh it's useful otherwise it can be overwhelming with so many narrative prompts. I've left one of the biggest parts of building a character to last because your creed, or what others might know as a class, is mostly in this book a vast repository of character tropes and archetypes 
that you can use to build your character however you want. They are really in-depth about providing you stories that you can uh, create and inspire you to uh, mix and match the things that you're interested in and then fit that into the group dynamic and the campaign dynamic. Um, and they provide you with all the the classic tropes of horror and uh, protagonists here. The most important thing you use your creed for is what they call desperation dice fields, which is the situation in which your character can use that dice pool of desperation dice. So for instance, if you are a faithful character, you can use desperation dice when you are in direct conflict with the monster. You want to destroy evil in some sense because it is against your faith. I uh, I really like this kind of archetype, but that's what you will mostly be using that for. Uh, there's also the marshal, which is uh, all about using physical force on a hunt. That's when you get to use your desperation dice. Um, there's also like the more investigative types, the more uh, sneaky types, and the underground and the inquisitive. Um, and they really provide a vast umbrella under which you can create your own versions of these characters. So for people really looking for inspiration, there's plenty there, but people that are quickly building for a short campaign or people that are looking to just build something that they already have in their head, uh, a creed doesn't provide a whole hell, hell of a lot. But narratively, it one of the, my favorite things that it does do are build um, kind of hooks into the campaign. For instance, one of the inquisitive archetypes is an old academic that is starting to get suspicious of Another academic that is getting pretty old now, but they've had a uh, tenure for a very long time that they're beginning to question why that is. Is it just nepotism or could it be a vampire controlling the institution to get what they want? They've created lots of micro stories that allow your player to be supernatural adjacent very immediately, which is quite nice because, I mean, to really get into the meat of a game, you're not going to spend hours going, oh, I wonder why things are floating around the room. That's so weird. No, you're going to be like, ah, oh, there, there's something weird here and I want to know what it is. I think it might be supernatural. That's like a, a basic starting point for all the characters that you can uh, jump from into, oh my God, ghosts exist. How do we get rid of them? Um, and then, you know, jump-starting your entire journey there. So that's the meat of Hunter the Reckoning. It also has some chapters on how to storytell, how to create a compelling narrative, a loop of expectation, reward, and uh, story hooks kind of going round and round if you want a, a longer campaign. It's got a lot of really, really excellent advice in there for both players and storytellers alike, as well as useful tools for calibrating the safety of you and your players as you go through uh, avoiding uh, difficult topics you don't or can't uh, cover while, you know, allowing you to explore the rest of the dark world. Overall, I would recommend this book. I think it's good for people that like the world of darkness, that entire universe, but it also has a lot in here for people that don't know anything about it, either want to learn more or just want a, uh, a system that provides that tension of going to fight the unknown of monsters or, you know, building stories about anything in the entire universe of movies and TV shows that set normal people against supernatural horrors. Um, and it does a lot to provide that experience. Um, yeah, I'm super excited. So if you want to learn um, how to play the game, what kind of vibe to expect from, uh, I guess, my perspective, I'm going to be releasing a video where I do a very short playthrough of it with some of my friends and I GM and uh, explain a, a little bit about the rules as we go. So expect that video somewhere down the line. Uh, but until next time, subscribe if this video was useful to you. I talk a lot about the world of darkness 
vampire and other role-playing games in general so if you want to hang out and talk about that stuff then please subscribe there's a bell i've heard and a thumbs up on the video wouldn't go amiss either i appreciate you watching but until next time goodbye